Ballet Board of Directors. I am also the co-chair of the museum's Building Truth campaign. I'm thrilled to welcome everyone in the room and watch and watching the live stream to tonight's conversation with Greg Golden and Hockey Bellsberg on the exciting plans for our Building Truth expansion program. For those who are new to Holocaust Museum in LA, we are the first survivor-founded and oldest Holocaust museum in the country and home to the West Coast's largest collection of Holocaust-era artifacts. Admission is free for all students and for youth 1700. Since day one, our mission has been grounded in teaching students and visitors the critical lessons and continued social relevance of the Holocaust, empowering them to stand up against hatred, bigotry, and anti-Semitism. We strive to build a culture rooted in kindness, Tolerance, empathy, and treating people with respect. Our work remains more vital than ever. Systematic anti Semitism, racism, and hate rhetoric is getting further entrenched into our current climate of political divide and public discourse. The Anti Defamation League's annual audit for 2022 revealed the highest number of anti Semitic incidents on record in the U.S. in three decades. Holocaust Museum LA offers customized tours, artifact-rich and high-tech exhibits, creative educational programs, and intergenerational conversations with Holocaust survivors. Our student programs are truly making an impact on behaviors. Students come in as bystanders and they leave as upstanders. Holocaust Museum LA opened the doors to its permanent home in Pan Pacific Park in 2010. The museum building, designed by acclaimed architect Hagi Belsberg, has received many architectural awards, including LEED Gold Certification, AIA Awards for Architecture and Interior Architecture, the Los Angeles Cultural Affairs Commission Design Honor Award, and the Green Building Design Award. Since our opening nearly 13 years ago, we have welcomed 600,000 visitors. Annual visitorship has increased by 400% with requests for student tours and public programs outpacing our ability to meet them. So in 2020, we launched our Building Truth expansion plan to double the museum's footprint without losing any green space in the park. We will soon break ground on the new Jonah Goldrich campus that will allow us to keep survivor voices alive amplify our reach and impact, and increase our visibility. We will be able to accommodate significantly more visitors, special exhibits, and educational and public programs. As a culturally specific museum, it is important for us to acknowledge that we are gathered on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of the, of the Tongav, Tongva people. The Gabrielino Tongva tribe has a rich cultural and spiritual heritage, and their presence and influence can still be felt throughout the region. We recognize the contrib contributions of the many indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island who call Los Angeles their home today. We pay our respects to their elders, past and present, and honor their continuing connection to this place. Uh, for, for those who haven't had the good fortune of yet meeting Hagi, you're in for a treat. After receiving his Master's of Architecture with distinction from Harvard University, Hagi returned to Los Angeles to find BA Collective, now a 30-person architecture and interior design firm. His unwavering commitment and skills have resulted in a diverse portfolio of award-winning, of award pardon me, I guess I need to stop alliteration, built works across North America. He has held teaching positions at UCLA, USC, and SciArt, and continues to serve as a guest lecturer and guest critic at various institutions. Hagi is also a board member of Holocaust Museum LA. His father escaped from Poland in 1932 and would subsequently lose family members in the Holocaust. Our moderator for the evening is Greg Golden. Greg is an architecture critic and author of Never Built Los Angeles and Never Built New York. He curated Windshield Perspective and Never Built Los Angeles at the A plus D Architecture and Design Museum and writes regularly for Los Angeles Magazine, among other publications. Greg, I will turn this over to you. Well, thank you and welcome everybody.
I, I want to dive right in because um, this is a very big topic we're going to approach. And I don't think there, we're not going to have any answers. We're only going to have the building in the end, which we'll get to. So to put a framework around what I think we'd like to discuss is since the Holocaust, there has been a, call it a philosophical question or debate. How do you embody in a physical structure the nature and meaning of one of the worst events in human history? Not singular per se, but certainly, I mean, I'm trying to think. Do the math, everybody. I think we know. Um, how, how do you approach this problem of turning a physical space into something that has meaning? And there has not been one single answer. For many architects, that answer has been you have to state the Jewishness of the problem and it has to somehow um, find its way into the tradition of what so-called Jewish architecture is, although anybody who looks at what Jewish architecture is will soon discover that it's virtually indistinguishable from the place in which it arose. So that, that one you can probably scratch off the list, but still that becomes one of the ways to express it. Another way is a kind of figurative idea, and we're going to show you a couple of slides in a moment, of giving some sort of meaning or life to a building through a very specific imagery. And then there is what you could call a poetic approach. So Hoggy, I'm gonna let you push, there we go. Okay, well first up here, just to give you guys, I think the context. This is Eric Mendelssohn, who um, was exiled from uh, Germany, a, a German Jewish architect, and um, really one of the founders of expressionist kind of architecture of the, the early 20th century, uh, something of, I, you could describe him, very sympathetic to the, to the Russian Revolution, did some really remarkable, beautiful drawings, none of which ever got built, I think. I don't know if there were any built. Um, and he was asked uh, soon after the war to design a memorial in Riverside Park in New York City. I don't know if many of people know the park, but it's a very popular place right overlooking the Hudson, and his answer was, it's pretty clear, I think, what his answer is. Here you've got the, essentially, a, a sort of abstracted version of the Torah, and it, it, it's, I would describe as pretty doggone Jewish for a guy whose architecture I don't really think of as being especially Jewish. Um, how many years later, maybe 15 years later, Louis Kahn, um, who himself, I don't think he really, until he began to look at these things, he didn't have a strong identification as a Jewish person, per se. And he was told to come up with a memorial in the Battery, which is at practically the opposite end of the island from where Mendelssohn's you know, memorial was going to be. And his is this, this, it's hard to see in the drawing, but six glass cubes or prisms really. Um, I think they were gonna be 11 feet tall with uh, a kind of um, sacred space in the center of these six columns. And it was completely poetic. I mean, there's nothing about this that if you were to encounter it in the battery that would say to you, this is a, what was the, the I'm going to read you the title because it's rather uh, an awkward title. This thing was called the Memorial to Six Million Jewish Martyrs. That's what it was going to be, therefore the six glass towers. But that was it. That was sort of the entirety of, the, the, his, his language had almost nothing to do outwardly with the, what you would presume to be the task at hand. And he was told by the committee that, this by the way never got built for those of you who have never been to New York or to the Battery, <laughs> didn't, didn't happen just so you know. It, 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 the notion was, and forgive me for reading, it, it was to build a monument for Jewry as well as all humanity, a monument that would explicitly stress man's ability to enter the realm of moral action and to deal with man's struggle to retain his dignity under the most horrendous circumstances and express hope for a better future where man will not merely survive but prevail. That's a pretty high moral standard. 
So I'm tossing it out at you, Hoggy, to begin with. Yeah, there, oh, well, yeah, there, this, is, this is another answer, by the way. I mean, <laughs> I guess we didn't really need this slide, but here's Daniel Liebeskin. This is pretty new, how this is maybe a year old now. Um, you know, Daniel Liebeskin, uh, who very much, I think, identifies and is identified as a Jewish architect. This is his memorial uh, museum in Ottawa, Canada, for those of you who know is the capital of Canada, although everyone forget, seems to forget that. And it, 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 when you look at it this way, you know it's Daniel Liebeskin because it's got this sort of shards, and yet it is an elongated or, ex, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? It is the Star of David drawn out. Uh, that's the form the building takes. So you, you can see even, but these are three, ex I could give you 25 examples from around the world of things built and not built. There's no definitive idea of what expression a building should give to the Holocaust. So that's one framework that I think we're gonna put around our discussion this evening. The other one is kind of, it. It, it flows from that in a way, but it comes out of personal experience and probably an experience that to some extent all of us who are at least my age, which is, you know, approaching septuagenarian, I think is the number. Um, you know, I grew up in this neighborhood. I went to Fairfax High School in the early 1970s. And, um, you know, there were a lot of, I don't know how many kids, but a number of kids at, at my high school whose parents were Holocaust survivors. And it meant next to nothing to them or to us, or at least we didn't know outwardly how it meant to them, but it didn't mean very much. I walked through this park, which wasn't a park then, Pan Pacific Auditorium was still here. They still did the auto show every single year here. There was the Pan Pacific uh, movie theater. And practically on this spot, and we can show you the picture of the, there was a memorial. I had no idea there was a memorial. So the Holocaust, here in this park, you went by and it, it meant very little to us as Jewish kids growing up at a in a predominantly Jewish neighborhood at a predominantly Jewish high school. If I went somewhere with my grandfather who was a Polish uh, Jew, anytime he saw a Mercedes, he would mumble something under his breath about those damn German cars. And if he saw, and I don't know how he ever figured this one out, if he saw a Jewish person driving a Mercedes, immediately it was Judenrat. That, that was what he would say. And it's still the Holocaust meant very little to me. And so I think to myself, we're 78 years out. That was only 25 years after the Holocaust. What do you do? So how do we communicate that as well? Those are the two things that I want to sort of throw open to Hoggy, and I'm gonna let him begin with his answers. And I think there's a couple of buildings we can look at first, right? Correct, and thank you, Greg. And Greg and I have been talking uh, considerably about how do you approach a new building for, or how do you expand on a, an existing museum that has a very significant approach to its design. And to design the future, you really need to understand why we designed this building this way. So I want to start by first referencing how we approach this building. And the first thing we did, you know, this is, this is such a tough subject, right? It's not, it's not just the Holocaust we're trying to represent. You know, there's, you know, why is this still going on? Why does humanity continue to cannibalize itself? There is, you know, since there, before the Holocaust, there are, the Armenian uh, Holocaust. There was the, you know, afterwards, there's still, it, it just still continues. It goes N Native on. Americans in California legally could be killed when the United States, after the, you know, the U.S. took over in 1848. By law, you could kill an, a Native American, period, full stop. And you would think after the Holocaust, this would end. But there's Pol Pot, there's Bosnia Herzegovina, there's Rwanda. It doesn't stop. So when you design, when you're asked to think of a building to describe tragedy on, on such an enormous scale, you know, do you look at trying to replicate what people are supposed, to, you're trying to tell people how they're supposed to feel? Or do, you, or do you look at something 
as, as in content, something that allows people to feel what they need to feel to understand the context in which we're representing. And it's really interesting, there's this fantastic book by Rosenfeld, uh, Building After Aus Auschwitz, and he, he quotes Adorno in 1949. Already in 1949, Adorno is, is predicting that the Holocaust and its representation will be mimicked and, and exploited in its representation. And we, and we ask the question, what is the architecture of tragedy? That's what, that's what we're really trying to dig down into. And I'm unbelievably grateful to, to Jane Bellsberg, my wife, who had gone through this ordeal with me for now over 10 years and asking the question and going back and forth philosophically. Her contributions has been extraordinary. Looking at some buildings around, around the United States. You know, this is um, by Newman Smith Architects in 1984. And on the cover of the Wall Street Journal, um, at the time when it opened, it said, should a museum look as disturbing as what it portrays? It's a hospital. <laughs> it, it's, it's unbelievable to me. The iconographic elements, there's Bob wire. I don't know if you can see, but the paneling on the outside are pajama patterns from prisoners. That's the outside of the building. And, and you ask yourself, why, why, why represent uh, these iconic elements? And, and the answer was to, they wanted patrons to feel the Holocaust, but how do you do that by putting patterns of pajamas on a wall or mimicking barbed wire? You can see, and then they put it, it, it doesn't, and then making it a, a, a modern-esque building. It becomes kitschy, it becomes Disneyland. And then you look at St uh, Stanley Tigerman for the Holocaust Museum um, in, um, in Illinois, right next to Skokie, outside of Chicago, in 2009. And, and here he's doing these kind of post-classical um, elements that look like warehouses, and he, and he creates Solomon columns and a, and a black building and a white building. And, and again, you have to ask yourself, how is somebody supposed to understand these? He's trying to tell people, this is what I want you to understand and see. And what he's also saying, though, um, is, well, he's, he's trying to have you read the building. And I don't know if that's appropriate. And then you look at the most the most important building in our country is the National Holocaust Museum. And this one I have a real problem with because the exterior is, you know, Speer could have designed this. And it is neoclassical. This was Speer's palette. And the argument, this is uh, uh, Pei, Fried, and Cobb. And their argument was, well, we wanted it to blend into the mall. But it's not on the mall. And it's not a public piece of land. It's private. And like the National Gallery, the architects could have broken away to, to create their own identity, but they didn't. They, they, they assimilated, which is... Hagi, may I ask, when you look at buildings like that, do you feel as if the building is kind of like a morality tale? That, that you just have to accept the fact that... Um, that whatever the meaning of the Holocaust is, you're not permitted to interpret it for yourself, it's already been pre-digested and accepted as this is bad. Someone was wrong, you're right. That, in there lies the big problem because there is no right and wrong. There is, my strategy was allow people, non-Jews, all people to feel what they need to feel to experience it the way they need to experience it, to connect it to their own tragedies, their own historical uh, stories. So you can't put, uh, you can't put a, 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 an iconic element. That was my biggest problem. I, so, 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 it's, it's, so they're taking the moral high ground and you're saying you can't do you that. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. You have to respect the intelligence of, of people and not try to dictate what they need to know. I mean, look at the inside. The inside, this is, for anyone who's ever been here, this is supposed to represent, um, this is what they considered Holocaust architecture. What part of the Holocaust? A train station, 
a ghetto, this, there's a bridge that's supposed to represent the Warsaw Ghetto. What about, what about the tragedies of, of Greece? What about what happened, you know, it, it, it's just picking a story of the Holocaust doesn't allow anybody to connect their own past, their own story, no matter who they are. And that's the problem I really have with representational architecture. Let the content speak for itself. Let the history speak for itself. So we come to Eisenman's piece, which is so powerful. This is in Berlin. And, and Peter Eisenman created this memorial to um, the, fall, the, the murdered, he called it the murdered Jews, unlike what Kahn said, which was uh, he kind of, kind of avoided that term. Eisman said, no, this is a memorial and a museum to the murdered Jews. But what he did here was very abstract, very, though very powerful, in the center of the city. But what happens here, it's not just a memorial. What's important is what also happens here. Kids play on it. People have picnics on it. People have weddings. There are photo shoots here. People, people spray paint on it. And he loves it. He thinks that's the perfect way to represent tra human tragedy. Because like during the Holocaust, when horrible, tragic things were happening in forests, in concentration camps, in cities, life went on. People had parties. People, people celebrated life. And that dialogue between, um, between what was, that dialogue was something that he thought his monument celebrated best. Isn't, isn't that where the rub really is, that tension exists between those people who feel you cannot, you have to create like a sacred place where the Holocaust just stands only on its own and it's like this, I don't know what you could call it, almost like this pit of misery and, and suffering and that's the only way to understand it and for it to be turned into, well, people may not know from some, I think there's one more slide, right, of the... I, I took that one Oh, out. you took it out. Oh, that's okay. There was another slide where, you know, the, the photo shoots that Hagi is talking about that are being done at this Eisman Memorial are literally magazine fashion shoots and you would have no idea. They don't, I'm not sure they know that this is a memorial to the Holocaust. So I think for some people, like if you were to talk to my grandfather, if he were still alive, he'd wag his finger at Eisenman and say, you dirty son of a bitch, you aren't expressing what needs to be expressed here. But that's the problem. Because once you idealize the monument, dialogue, ceases to exist. You want people to argue about it. You want people to make it contemporary. You want people to say, the way people are taking photo shoots for, for models and not knowing what it is, is exactly what's happening right now. We're here comfortable in this room and there's an, you know, there's an invasion of Ukraine. And we, life goes on, we, we need to discuss it, and that's why museums for the Holocaust, for other tragedies, need to invite contemporary dialogue. Otherwise, it, it becomes too precious, and it needs to be contemporary. We need to address how we are afflicted by this every day. So that's how we approached this museum. That's why you don't see a giant Jewish star. That's why you don't see um, Bob wire. That's why we actually took off from the existing monument here. The first thing we did was take off the Holocaust or Can you World go back to that slide so people can see it? Do, is it possible? You can, you would overlook it when you look at the slide, but. Sorry, it's okay. We can do a review. <laughs> you can, there, there you go. And then see? the anti-tank elements. There, it, it just, asks, well, what, what is somebody from, what is an immigrant from Honduras ask when he comes to see this? Or, or somebody from China, what, what does that have to do with their history? If we're trying to teach something, why isolate it? Why not open it up to something that allows people to envision their own past so they can relate it to the Holocaust? That's what makes the lesson more powerful. So, 
how we approached this was really with Eisenman's, and, and I was lucky enough to discuss this with Eisenman at UCLA when, you know, and, and, and was so grateful to his, his approach. When, you, when we were posed with this question, how do you design this building, the first thing that we were told was 15,000 LAUSD students will come here every year for free. That was the, pro that was the proposal. We're going to make a museum, but it has to be for LAUSD. We want to teach public school kids. So that's where we started. We started with this bus stop, with this bus cut out for, for, the, for the LA Unified. You want to tell them where we are? So, so this we're is actually... Pan Pacific Park. This is, exactly. Thank you. This whole thing is Pan Pacific Park. This is Grove. And the little butt we carved out this piece up here. This is where the existing monument was and is. And then the, the little cutout is here. So we would allow students, we captured the moment they got off the bus. And the first, some of these kids, some of these LAUSD kids, this is the only field trip they'll go on all year. This is it. And they come here, it's paid for. They get off the bus, and these are high school kids. Their hormones are going. They're just, you know, they're happy to be out. They're running crazy. And they see a park. That's all they see is a park. There's no building, and that was purposeful. They come out, and they see park. They see people holding hands. They see people walking their dogs, picnics, greenery, everything. And then they're asked to make a left turn and go down a ramp. And the idea here is much like the forest's in, in mid-30s Europe, murderous things were happening hundreds of yards away from public areas where people were holding hands and, and, and going about their business. And that's the dialogue we wanted to capture. That's the thing that's happening till today. So the idea was to allow them to see the, the contemporary and then have them walk down this ramp and slowly the sights, the sounds disappear. And all you hear, if you've ever walked down this ramp on a Saturday afternoon, you hear all of a sudden, all the noise goes away. And the idea is unearthing of stories. And they're not just stories of the Holocaust, but they're stories of people in Los Angeles of their stories of the Holocaust. And so we're making it regional. We're making it so that uh, somebody from Mexico City can say, you know, what, what, what is my part in all this? I'm coming to see a museum of, again, we designed this for students. I'm coming to see a museum of something that happened to another group of people a long time ago in another continent. What am I doing here? And that's the idea. That's to, that's, that's to ask them, the teachers, to involve themselves with that conversation. What are you doing here? Well, this happened to a group of people that started, some of them started in Los Angeles and went, to, and went to Europe to fight, and some of them were in Europe and came here to get away afterwards. And the first thing they see when they come into the museum and they're given their handhelds is a video by, um, and, and in, the ma in the video, this gentleman says, he's in a concentration camp and he identifies himself as an Angelino, he says, I'm from Los Angeles. And that is the moment where everything is supposed to coalesce, that they are envisioning themselves as Angelinos, part of a community. You come down this ramp, as I mentioned, and the sights and sounds go away, but you still have light. You still have twisting concrete. Concrete isn't supposed to do what it's doing here. Concrete isn't supposed to look fluid. So there's a, there's a, um, force of experience that we ask. You're underground, yes, you, yet you have a lot of light. You're two stories under. And the way we set up the museum, here's the lobby, this is where they see the video. As they go through the museum, every time you go through history, you go down a little bit into the depths of the, of the earth, and we have an opposing geometry of the, of the ramp and natural light. So we start with our first room, which is the existing, which was pre-World War II Holocaust, the life in, life in Europe, where everybody was effectively um, equal, 
effectively. But there wasn't, you know, it was it was the idea where everybody can can. Um, we we once had an interactive table where you saw people of all religions having a you know a, a wedding or playing soccer or something to show that that there was commonality but then you go you step a little bit deeper and the light starts to fade away and the ceiling starts to compress and that's when racism and um, the the rise of of um, of Nazism and it starts to starts to uh, feed into the story and then you go to the next room which is deportation the room gets a little bit deeper. I mean, sh sorry, the, the ceiling starts to compress a little bit more. Less natural light, hope fades away. And what we also try to invoke when you get to the last room, which is the concentration camps, is no light, no hope. Very, very short ceiling, or very, very compressed ceilings. Then you turn the corner, the proverbial turning of the corner of history, and all of a sudden you have righteous, those who have fought against, against and came to um, liberation and the end of the war. And, and that idea is that you end up where you started. So the question is, have we really progressed? What we also did with the architecture, um, uh, separate from the architecture, is we, we also worked on the exhibits, where we start with one room where everyone is collectively around a table, a dining room table. And then the exhibits slowly push people away. So now you are experiencing the Holocaust itself individually, as people did. And then as you turn the corner, the exhibits start forcing you to come together. These are immersive strategies that we experimented with so anyone could ex experience it. Anyone can understand it. There isn't this fake gun looking, you, you know, you're not looking down a barrel or, or you're not being told with, with this is how we want you to feel. The contents, the artifacts, that's what we want people to, to focus on. What's also interesting is we aligned the halls with, with um, silver plates of, of the Los Angeles Times Magazine, I mean Los Angeles Times, to, and, other, and other newspapers to show at certain points the insignificance of how it was reported across the seas in, in the United States and Los Angeles. Uh, let me ask you, sure. um, I think, this is what you're talking about, like, like uh, um, Softy did the same thing. It's not the same, but it's a similar idea of, of from light to darkness back into light. Um, but you chose a, um, you know, a concrete, which has this, you can feel the weight in this room, but also it's kind of neutral, very neutral. Um, why? What? The neutrality, it's a great question. The neutrality was to emphasize the contrast with the brutality. So what you see are exhibit walls that are black, the contrast, allowing the exhibits, the artifacts themselves to be illuminated. But what you also notice is the neutrality, the walls don't go to the ceiling. And the idea there is that we are a container. The Holocaust didn't happen in segments. It didn't happen, there was deportation, and that stopped. And then there was a concentrate, and that stopped. It's not true. Sometimes there was liberation while the concentration camps were still active. So the idea of not allowing these rooms to be cellular, silos, to show that there was a fluidity in between the time that we're trying to express was really a, 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 sim, a symbolic representation to everything happened at once. But we're trying to tell a story of the millions of stories, but that all these were still continuing. And that's why the ceiling, the neutrality, the datum is allowing the, 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 the free flow of the, of the timeline. For example, when you make the proverbial turn and we have the Auschwitz exhibit, you can see through it so you can be in liberation while you're looking right underneath and people are still being deported. That's the idea. Things didn't happen at the same time. With Softie's um, brilliant museum in Jerusalem, you are forced to go in, in order and you don't see back. Here, if you look back, you see a sailing ceiling with these moments, not silos. And that's the idea. Time 
was was gray. Time didn't didn't allow things to be so clean. So so the ceiling in that sense, I guess maybe neutrality is one way, but another it, it's it's almost like it's amoral. It ha it takes no stance whatsoever. It Correct. just says this is a continuum. Correct. And again, the idea is to focus on the artifacts, on the stories at hand, and not on. I mean, architecture is a container. Architecture it needs to be a humble support mechanism to immerse oneself into their own experience. Not again, it has to be neutral, not to to, to tell the individual what's happening. We were hammered. We were. We got. We got a lot of. We got some praise and we got some criticism. But that's fine. That's the dialogue that we're interested in. Oops. Um, a picture right, right when it was finished, the grass is still growing. The idea that this was, the architecture is part of the park. This was actually part of the, of the, of the architecture was really concrete from the, from the pathways and landscape. So it was an integration of the architecture. That's our language. Our language is the commonality. We also, for the back then, it's not the technology has moved, but back then we said to ourselves, look, let's try to teach this in different languages. Why teach it just, why assume everyone is speaking English? So we did allow these ideas of handhelds with the, uh, with the aspiration of, of you know, hundreds of languages that this could be taught in or you could be listened to. But we didn't just stop with the architecture of, of the container of artifacts. How do you then describe the atrocity of, I think it's 1.6, 1.5 million children being murdered? How do you really tell a high school kid, you know, somebody your age was murdered just because of, of, of their background, of their religion? How do, you t how do you tell that enormity? How do you, six million is hard enough. How do you go to 1.5? million of 16 year olds and under. So we devised this element where we took these panels and when we digitally um, scribed all these voids. So we tried to get in the children's memorial 1.6, we couldn't get even 1.6 million in there, we got 1.2. But the idea isn't just to associate a number of value to a child, or a, a teenager, how much is 1.2 of my, of my colleagues, of, you know, and, and, their, and their souls. It's where we placed it that makes a difference architecturally. There's no architecture here, right? It's open to the ceiling, open to the sky. But right on the other side of this wall is a playground. So the children, the high school students, get to go in here and see the enormity, the amount of loss in number. But at the same time, they're hearing kids play. That eeriness, that dialogue, is it, that's the power. Every child gets that, the, the loss and, the, and, and kids on the other side playing, hearing it. That's what we wanted to capture. It doesn't matter what culture you're from. You're going to experience it in your own way, but that's the power we were trying to get. And then it organically grew into its own. We never, we never anticipated people adopting a wailing wall kind of uh, experience where they now uh, write messages and put them in. And now it's an institutionalized element where these, these I believe they are kept, right? They're, they're, they're kept. So the kids write notes and they put them in there and they are, and they are placed in, in file. So that grew organically from this design. So how do we go from an existing building that was supposed to be for 15,000 people a year, and I think we're breaking at the seam at 75,000 or 80, 65,000 a year. This building was never meant to be designed for that many people. So this idea to create something new, an expansion, what's the purpose, what's the message, what's the mission? The mission is to teach. So we have artifacts, we have a collection, we have an extraordinary collection, now let's look to the future. Now let's teach classrooms, lecture halls, um, technology. That's the idea. So here's the existing building. Let's call that the unearthing of stories, the underground, the artifacts. And here is the new building. The building will have a very, very large room for temporary exhibits, for traveling exhibits, something we couldn't afford to occupy here. It will have um, classrooms 
And that's really important because they're not just for the students, they're night classrooms, they're, they, and they can be for anything. Now the Holocaust is a, is a case study for all tragic, for all events going on. Case study is a very powerful opportunity for what's happening around us. It will also have um, a, th a smaller theater for 30 people, quite about this size, where it's um, Dimensions and Testimonies. We're in partnership with USC Shoah Foundation, where we will be the beta laboratory um, using their holographic technology and AI. There's, there's one active right now, but you will be able, if you haven't experienced this yet, it's extraordinary. Well, you'll be able to ask a question to a survivor, in this case, um, one who passed, and no, other, other ones. No, she's still alive. There's others that there. And those who's passed, sorry. And those who have passed. Um, and be able to ask them anything. But it doesn't just, uh, it's not just a Holocaust survivor. The USC Show Foundation is using testimonials from, again, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Rwanda, um, Pol Pot. It, they're, they're going to be opportunities for, for witness and question AI questions from all tragedy, from all um, Shoahs and Holocaust. And then our, our, um, our 200 seat fixed theater seating, which we desperately, desperately need. And here the fixed seat theater will be able to do um, not only um, digital movies and such, but lectures, and it's also for performance, live performance. So it really does allow us to capture a lot more opportunities for the future. So how do you connect all these three? What now, what now other than just the programmatic elements? So the idea here to connect three buildings, we have the, we have the, under, we have the past, we have the artifacts, we have the future, learning, aspirational, looking towards the future, light, maybe above ground, bridging, and then we have a large courtyard, an open area, a place where you come in, you gather, you, you, you have a dialogue, as we mentioned earlier, but now there's a place for that dialogue, a place for a conversation. So we call that the present. So we have the past, the future, and the present. And the idea to connect all of these is really the only symbolic, real symbolic element that we've, we've appropriated to the design, and that's like a chuppah. But a chuppah, to a Jewish, um, um, uh, to to a to a to sim Jewish symbolism, we first think wedding, but that was only adopted in the 1500s. I didn't know that either. That was only adopted in the 1500s, and it's really an Ash it was an Ashkenazi thing that was adopted. Biblically, it was an architectural feature. It was Abraham's tent. But what was significant about a chuppah is what I love about this is it's a canopy. Chupa means canopy, that's it. And it's open on four ends. It's a pole and it's open. And what's significant about that is it's to invite. It's transparent. It's hospitality. It's, co it's community. So this chupa gathers the three buildings, but more importantly, it gathers us. And it doesn't say you have to be Jewish. It doesn't say you have to be talking about the Holocaust. It says, come, gather, gather under here. This is where we can have a dialogue. And that's really the symbolism that we wanted to invoke. So here are some renderings of the, of the approach. We're keeping the, the bus stop. For the first time, I don't know, I wanted to talk about that other picture of the, of the building when it was finished. We purposefully did not put any walls around this building. We had no fences, no, no, no security other than in the building. We had human aspirations, trust, and it, it worked beautifully. There weren't the graffitis. There, there, there were some horrible things that happened, but not to the extent that we were, we were um, initially criticized that would happen. It really worked, but unfortunately, this is a different time. Ten years ago, this was a very, very different world, and this world transformed quickly. So we do now have a fence, a security fence, but you can see through it. Transparency, still the ideological idea, not a wall, but a fence, so you can see through it. The chuppah, the canopy, is lifted up over it. The, older, the existing building, the newer building, and then behind here is the courtyard. And, and 
Hoggy, the newer building, it runs, so people understand, it runs parallel to the Grove Street, which is probably one of the things that will be responsible for the next Holocaust. Um, that building look, is, looks out, it's elevated, and it looks out over the park. Correct. And there it is. And it looks out over the park. This is the other side of the Grove. And many of you may know this feature. If you don't, this, is, um, this whole area is a water retention facility for a 100-year flood. And we just had our 100-year, and it did not flood. Um, so I don't really know what it's for. They but, miscalculated. But this, this captures, we're at a low point. This is just some geography. We're at a low point between here it rises up before LA rises up before it goes to Santa Monica. So we're at a, like a little dip. And this channel, there's two channels that come in, one from Third Street and one from Beverly. And it really captures all the water in the area. It's supposed to capture all the water in the area. What it's really capturing is all the broken DWP pipes <laughs> and sprinklers that hit perched clay and come here. But the idea is that these are little riprap's that slow down the, that are theoretically supposed to slow down the water when they open the gates and, and, and allow the water to come in. But this was a, a long time, when we started, this was a gazebo and undeveloped areas sometimes invite things that, you, that we can't control and aren't safe. Developing it puts more eyes on the, on the arena. And we were able to, to work out a, uh, a rental agreement where we are able to occupy the space. But the problem is it's, it's um, if, philosophically it worked for us perfectly, but it is a bridge. And we created a bridge building. We, we had to bridge over the water retention element. So you can see we're expressing the, we're, we're honestly expressing the, the trust system, but we're, we're again creating this novel uh, fluidity in the concrete so it matches the existing language. What does that fluidity mean there? I understand what it means here. You're coming down, you're progressing through the space. This is the place, this is the heart of the museum in the sense of this is where you really get an idea about the Holocaust. But these spaces aren't really about that. To us, again, it's, it's about allowing expression to, be, to free itself up. It doesn't have to be perpendicular. It can twist. It can erode. It can be fluid. It can be. It can hint. Can hit to organic, and that's again the idea. The idea of dialogue goes in many directions, inviting the dialogue to go to, in many directions. Any kind of questioning, not rigidity. Any time of questioning allows for information. Any kind of information gathering will eventually, optimistically, slow the the. Um, S slow human nature and, and, and put us on a better way. So it's that's a the metaphor idea. for tolerance. Or that's, is it? That, that's a good one that I, I didn't thought of that. But it, it's, it's a metaphor for, for opportunity, for openness, for things do not have to, concrete does not have to be um, categorized as, as rigid. It could be categorized as fluid. So some respecting the um, the, um, the amphitheater, so now we're participating in park programs, so now we have a partnership where we can uh, uh, open ourselves up to other activities, so dance and music and other activities can be part of, the, of, of our programs. We're not eliminating one, we're adding something extraordinary. The, the black families have um, um, uh, contributed a, a boxcar, an authentic boxcar, and um, we're creating a pavilion for it. But specifically, it sits on top of this building for good reasons. It's an artifact. It's still teaching the past. So it belongs with the artifacts. And this is an image of the, of the new trans, uh, the new, um, uh, the, bridge. Uh, the bridge that is, that acts as the, uh, um, the exhibit hall. And what is so exciting about this exhibit hall that you can't see in this picture is we could never really capture these very, very valued 
exhibits that needed a certain type of insurance. We are now hermetically sealed. We have humidity control, temperature control. We can close these off and have light control. So we are now able to invite exhibits from all around the world. We are now going to be on the forefront. Um, off this hall are the classrooms and the digital um, testimony theater. And then the theater itself, as I mentioned, it's a um, fixed seat 200 person theater and it really can also act as performance as well, which is, makes life oh, very difficult. And then at night we are illuminating the hupa, the canopy, and it becomes a beacon, safety. It just becomes iconic in its own right, just saying, we are here, we are here. Do you want to do your fly through or do I don't think we need it? What do you think? Or should we open it up to questions? I don't know what our time is. We can open up to questions. Do you want to go back to this or do you want? We can well, open up to. Well, I mean, you guys can see where, okay. where, where uh, we don't need to, but I, I think we've covered that. So maybe but, during questions we can allow this to. Yeah, we can. This is just you can get an idea of it in motion pictures. But um, yeah, we're, we're, let's open it up to questions if there are any. It's going to go through on a loop. It, it, it'll just do itself. Someone must have a question. There's got to be a question. No questions? Tell us how to get from the box car to the Thank you. That's, to the new building. I'm so sorry I missed that. Okay. Every time you leave one of the, I'm so grateful to you. Every time you leave one of these experiences, the existing museum, the new boxcar pavilion, or the traveling exhibit. You must travel through the open courtyard. You have to, we force that scenario. So do, again, gathering, questioning, pause. Um, some people travel through exhibit faster than, faster than others, but it's, it's, tr it's a transition that allows um, you to experience the park. So I'm always asking you the question, once you leave one of these exhibits, looking at the contemporary, looking at people enjoying themselves, and then going back to the difficult subject matter, you always have to filter through the common ground. D D Hagi, does it concern you that um, something as palpable as a genuine boxcar that was, you know, people were deported in that car and they didn't come back, that, that it can, it can, um, I don't know what, how to express this exactly, but that it can become the only thing you end up focused on. You know, overwhelm. It, it's, that's a great question, and I don't think I have the ability to answer it. It's, it's too big of a question. For, for us, we decided to remove everything from that space and allow the boxcar to be on its own and an exhibit that describes it and allow people to connect the dots. So there's nothing in the architecture that really tries to promote more of, what's, of, of what is said. But seeing this boxcar, no matter who you are, and understanding what it is, and seeing the, the actual photographs of what it was doing, floors you, guts you. It, you, are, you are stopped and, and immediately confronted with this enormity of, of of how could this have happened. You know, we have these extraordinary artifacts here, but something li bigger than life, you know, is, is, is haunting, and that's what we allow people to experience here. Oh, thank you. Again, I'm, I'm, I'm missing my, uh, my own <laughs> strategy. Um, when you leave the box car, before you go to another, the, the courtyard and stuff, you're also offered, because of its this sig singular powerful piece, there is uh, Mia Lair, uh, extraordinary landscape architect, is the landscape architect for this entire project, but she created a, a small garden, a momentary pause where you can meet with your teacher, with, your, with a docent, with a volunteer, and, or maybe just by yourself and have a meditative pause to really comprehend what you had just experienced. Yes. I'm curious, with the, um, the Martin Luther King Museum in, in Memphis has a, actually a, a, um, 
a bus that you can get on and the bus driver yells it, screams at Rosa Parks to move to the back of the bus. And it is the most affecting, one of the most affecting exhibits that I know of. And I don't know if you'll allow people to get onto the boxcar because it is a very confining space and would be very experiential, for, especially for the kids. We and that's one question. The more mundane question is, what about parking? <laughs> That's the LA question. The, the first question is, unfortunately, we can't let people in because it's such a rare artifact, such a rare piece that um, it's priceless. So any, any carvings into it, any defacing of it, it's, it's a soul. You know, so many people perished in these boxcar even before they, it's, it's a soul to us, so, so we have to respect it in its, um, from a distance. And unfortunately, we're not gonna let people go in. It will be open so you can peer inside, and there are photographs of what it was like. But to protect it for many generations, unfortunately, we're not gonna allow people to go inside. That was the harder question. The easier question is parking. Um, um, Caruso had, um, had he was extremely, extraordinarily gracious and worked with the museum to work out a, a deal for parking at the Grove where, um, where there is a, there's a reciprocity there that, he's, that he has allowed us to park there for, um, to, to uh, attend the museum. Uh, oh, Susan, you want images are you going to use? So for the new museum, we're Do not going to repeat the question. What yeah. kind of artifacts does the museum, does the museum have? have? So cur this museum has, um, this collection is, is, is quite large. You're only seeing a, a bit of it because we have um, um, some in storage. Um, but uh, I, would, I would let Lisa answer the extent behind the scenes. But the artifacts we have here is really a collection from um, think of it as like a depository of the survivors that came to Los Angeles, and that's really where it started. I believe it's the I, I, I believe it's the oldest Holocaust museum in the country. Um, even though it never had a home, it is the oldest Holocaust museum in the country because these Holocaust survivors came together, shared their not only their memories and their experiences, but also their 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 artifacts, their pieces. And as it was collected, um, it grew and grew, and more people um, uh, contributed. So now we have quite a large collection, and, um, but only a, a, some of it is shown. In the new museum, I don't believe we're gonna be showing any um, artifacts. Maybe there'll be our own traveling of what we're, we don't have exhibited here, but it's really meant to invite um, exhibits from all over the world. Hoggy, let me ask you a question. You know, it, it's, it's, I have a personal connection, I've told you about this, to that boxcar. Um, one of my cousins was on the last train to leave France, the Drancy, which is just outside of Paris, was the place where they deported um, French Jews. And uh, there was a, a train that's now famous. There were 900 Jews on this train. And the train took off. And nobody knows what happened. They never made it to one of the death camps. They, the, 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 the belief is that everyone, the war was coming, imminent end to the war. They just marshaled everyone off the trains and mowed them down with machine guns somewhere in Germany, maybe even in France. When you go to Drancy today, you don't even know that the railroad depot was there. And so I, I guess my question is, you know, this is, this is, I guess for me, I wouldn't even be able to come close to that. I wouldn't go near that train car because it's that deeply personal. But with memory, sometimes it's the thing that you don't see. You know, you go to Drancy and there isn't anything there. And that becomes the most evocative I throw that out to you, sorry, in, in a way that like, how do you handle that, the absence? The, the, the gestalt, it's, yeah. it's, it's, again, it's, um, that's hard. It, we can't, we can't possibly try to um, teach everything, to exhibit everything, to express everything. What we can do 
the, the, what's missing is probably the most powerful because look, this country has, you know, we're, we're, we're just using the Holocaust just. We are using the Holocaust as a case study. Slavery, indigenous people, there's, there's too much. There's too much in humanity. But what we can do with what we have is, is show that even though we say never again, it's still happening. It's still going on. And that's the dialogue we're trying to capture with, with kids in high school. That's the best we can do. So the not having is the most powerful because that's the most dangerous. We'll take one last question. Yes, and pass the microphones. Thanks. Um, rewinding back to pandemic, kind of that timeline in which I'm sure all of us were on a level of personal reflection, were there any personal breakthroughs or moments of realization that you translated to this project or informed this project, um, whether it's yourself or your, um, your team? That's a really great question because um, not only is the pandemic a new existential force and condition, it's the great equalizer. I, it, I'm just speaking in terms of it is not a singular, it doesn't affect one group, one type, it's, it's the great equalizer. And I, I never thought of, I mean, I, I think that's the way we need to um, look at the opportunity, but in terms of design, I mean, look, I just found out today that this is being broadcast, uh, you know, and simul or whatever, it's, it's I, that freaks me out. That's a, that's a product of the pandemic where we would normally have just us having a conversation and now it's, it's out there, you know, in real time. And I think if I were to be able to add some money to this budget, it would be, it would be how do we capture a museum that is at one time um, one that you experience literally, but can you experience it virtually at the same time? And that's something that I think will be a growth from the pandemic. Maybe um, a, a, a student from a high school is there, but his mom and dad can see it at home as he's walking or she's walking. That would be fantastic. That's technology. That's, that's something that we should be able to do, so. Ah, well, see, we're doing it. <laughs> During the pandemic? Well, I, Hoggy, thank you. I want to thank everyone for coming. I think there's some nibbles, nosh, uh, in, and, right, you can buy a copy of Hoggy's book and have him personally goes, dedicated all, to everything you. Everything goes all... All, yeah. everything goes to the museum. There you go. So thank you very much, and we'll see you in the little reception area.